we discuss the biggest trades and signings of NHL free agency. We've got your Chicago Blackhawks with Brooke Laferno, Boston Bruins with Logan Mullen, and Toronto Maple Leafs with Rob Del Mundo. Hit the music. <laughs> Welcome to Jablam Sports Hockey, folks. I'm your host, Peter Borjaranov, and the mic is always on. You can find me on Twitter, at Russian98. You can find the full show, at Jablam Sports. If you have any questions or comments, please tweet us. Use the hashtag Jablam Sports. That's J-A-B-L-A-M Sports. Please subscribe to us if you haven't done so yet, and click on the three dots in your podcasting app. Share our show with three hockey fans you know. Thank you, everyone. Remember, check out our website, go to jablamsports.com, see all our podcasts, and even game notes for each episode. You'll get links to all the things we mentioned on this show, including guests. For our podcasts, click on podcasts, and then hockey on this show specifically right on our website. Let's start in the West with some big movers and shakers. Joining to discuss the Chicago Blackhawks is Brooke Laferno. She covers the Blackhawks for the Hockey Writer. You can reach her on Twitter at Brooke underscore L-O-F-O. Welcome to the show, Brooke. Thank you so much for having me. It was a wild free agency and moves. It just seems like this year, it wasn't just free agency. It was teams making a lot of moves after the draft leading up into free agency. I think with the expansion thing, it kind of held teams back a bit and they didn't want to make moves until after. Wow. Yeah. Chicago just went crazy, it seemed like. Yeah, they did. And I I think I was expecting something because obviously they had another disappointing season, but I wasn't expecting it to be on that scale. I kind of figured there'd be some like low key moves but not what to the extent of this it's been crazy let's get into the big splash before the free agency and that's Mm -hmm. of course bringing Seth Jones from Columbus obviously Mm -hmm. Jones didn't want to stay with the Blue Jackets so they traded him and a first and a sixth to Columbus for Adam Buchvist two firsts and a second the Blackhawks lock him up 76 million for eight years that's 9.5 million tied for the biggest signing in this free agency or you can't of course you can consider i guess a free agency for Braden point going with to tampa but wow at least he's won back-to-back cups jones is still kind of i guess entering his prime is this a good move for the blackhawks brook i mean i always said on our show blackhawks banter that I was so for getting a defenseman. I didn't care who it was. I didn't care if it was Seth Jones, Dougie Hamilton. I was just all for getting a number one defenseman. So when I heard we traded that they traded for him, I was actually excited. However, I got a little nervous about that contract. If he ends up kind of really entering, because I know he has yet to kind of hit his stride, then I think it'll be great. But if he doesn't work out, then that's just going to be another cap issue. But I, for right now, I like it and it's exciting, but, there is a little bit concerned there, but like I said, it's kind of all going to have to play out. If he fits here really well and he plays well with our defense, then, yeah, I think this will be a great move. But, yet, yeah, um, Stan Bowman kind of set the tone uh, during free agency with that contract because now everyone seems to be kind of getting that limit now at nine and a half or $9 million. Yeah, it's, everybody's matching that. That is that is true. So they move on from those veterans they had on the blue line. Uh, Duncan Keith? Goes mm-hmm. to the Oilers. Mm-hmm. Uh, Seabrook goes to Tampa, bringing in Tyler Johnson. Mm-hmm. Where will Tyler Johnson fit in this lineup? So that was actually one of my favorite moves I think that they made was Tyler Johnson. I always, I really like the way he plays, and I figured that the Blackhawks need a center that's reliable and can also score. That's something that they really needed. And I always said that I think he fit best on maybe Tampa's third and fourth line because they're so stacked. But maybe on this team, on the Blackhawks, it might be a little different. I can actually see him kind of um, 
kind of going anywhere, maybe second line, third line, fourth line, only because we don't know what Taze's status will be. Mm -hmm. um, Kirby Dock's supposed to be coming back pretty strong, but like I said, there's too many holes and question marks right now. I can kind of just see him fitting in everywhere, which I love. I love that versatility. So I'm still thinking maybe he'll fit in bottom six, but I wouldn't be surprised to see second or third either. We also saw Nikita Zadorov, another defenseman, shipped out to Calgary. Mm -hmm. we, you, you told us about Jones coming in. He's got too many skates to fill now. Keith's gone. Yeah. Seabrook obviously wasn't playing as much. And now Zadorov. Who are they going to boost up since they also traded up Bukvist? Who's being boosted up into this lineup to get a bigger role? Well, I think Connor Murphy, well, I mean, he already was technically seeing um, number one defenseman minutes. So I think he'll probably still stay there. Calvin DeHaan, um, while he's still here, I know the Blackhawks were thinking about shopping him, but while he's still here, he'll really play a big role too. And I kind of think that will even out um, a lot of the rookies that were here with uh, Wyatt Kalanoff, Ian Mitchell, and also Caleb Jones, Seth Jones's brother, the Joe Bros. Um, he'll probably gain a, I think, pretty good minutes too, because I think because of the brother thing, I think we'll kind of see a pairing of them maybe a lot. I think they said they know that they can complement each other, maybe that can help. But yeah, for the most part, I think it's more about just upping kind of the minutes of the defense, kind of that they already had with Murphy and Dehan. I just think they'll continue to see big moments with Seth Jones. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up Caleb. So you have a law firm possibly on the blue line of Jones and Jones. Is, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, what's that? that? I don't know if I've ever seen that in the NHL, at least a pairing on the blue line of brothers. Yeah, I have not either, to be honest. And I was like, if that actually comes to fruition, everyone is going to be so confused with the Jones. Jo like, no one's going to know which Jones we're talking about, but I love it. I think that'll be so much fun. But yeah. That would be interesting because I don't think we've, I've really seen that either. Another shocking move. We haven't even got to it. I guess I'm bearing the lead on this. And that is Marc-Andre Fleury being traded from the Vegas Golden Knights for a prospect, Mikhail Hakkarainen. <laughs> wow. Um, first thing I want to touch base is Fleury, it seemed awkward obviously it didn't look like he wanted to be traded mm -hmm. then we even saw the the tweets of like him putting on the jersey and even that looked kind of awkward it did oh man i don't know what do you think do you, do you feel his full heart is into this do you think it's he's all in uh, how do you think this is going to play out with uh, mark andre joining the team well, here's the thing. I love Marc-Andre Fleur. He's honestly one of my favorite goalies in the league. So I think I honestly love the addition, even though it probably doesn't make a lot of sense considering that the Blackhawks are kind of rebuilding and he should probably go to a team that's going to win now. But either way, love it, love him. And to be honest, he kind of always has seemed like, you know, a stand-up guy. And I really don't think that if he truly felt like his heart or mind was going to be in it, he would not play. So I hope that that's the case that he's into it because I have to believe that that's just the kind of guy he is I'm not gonna doubt kind of his commitment but um yeah I think it will work out he he took some time and like I said I think because of like that five days where there was no noise from him at all I really do think if he didn't think he could do it then he would have just retired and I honestly would not have blamed him for that at all he's won three cups you know he deserves to do whatever the heck he wants to do he is astonishing he's been in the NHL for so long you mentioned the cups his storied career, and it seems like he's always been able to reinvent himself. The move to Vegas, obviously, that was not a shocker with right. the Penguins and their salary cap issues and keeping Murray at the time. So he had a great first season. Nobody expected Vegas to go all the way to the finals in that first year. Then right. again, last year, he had even possibly one of his best seasons of his career. Everybody thought he was almost done, and he did that. He got nominated and and got the Vesna, Mark Andre Fleury. Are we going to see possibly another reinvention of Mark Andre Fleury or another amazing season in Chicago? 
you know what he kind of reminds me of patrick kane in a weird way kind of like where they're getting older and everyone probably thinks oh this is the year they're gonna start to really like go downhill and they just keep getting better but i am going to be i still think he's going to be fabulous i actually have no doubts about him but i do have a little bit of doubts about the team in front of them they got better defensively but it's still kind of a newish defensive system that i think everyone is still trying to get used to i think there's a lot of confusion there still so but if he does have issues i don't think it's going to be on behalf of him like I said, we had Corey Crawford and Robin Leonard both basically have career years with the Blackhawks, and even they couldn't mask what was right in front of them. Again, the team that will be out there next season will be a lot better, so I hope that will kind of reflect that. But, yeah, if I don't think he's going to have any issues. I think it just depends on the team in front of him. I know there was rumors with all the different trades that teams wanted Philip Kurashev moved, and Chicago didn't want to budge on Kurashev. How much of a special player is he? So I actually really like Kurashev. He's not really flashy, but he can really make those really cool, nifty plays. And that's what I kind of love about him. And I, in a way, I we were kind of talking about this on our Blackhawks banter show too. We don't really see him as someone that could be untouchable, but he is a very good piece and maybe next year they'll get an even better idea of what he could really be because I mean it was his rookie season one year okay and that was pretty impressive even for him but yeah he's a really good player I think to have on any team he's not going to be like a top two kind of player but he's just that really good complimentary player that can score can kind of do all those nifty kind of uh, stick work stuff like that I really like him he's a good complimentary player for sure and I hope next year we'll get to really like he'll um, hopefully kind of come out of his shell more and we can see more of that skill. Wow. It's the summer of changes. There's still a lot of summer to go. We're still <laughs> far away. I sound like Christopher Walken right now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's still a lot of time to go. And do all these moves, at least they've already made so far, there's so many of them. Mm-hmm. With all the changes... It's hard to put a team together, but are they now possibly a playoff team when you look at it now? Um, I think they should be. If they can't at least make the playoffs with this team, I think that will be kind of an issue. I mean, they upgraded at goaltender, which is what they needed to. They did add some scoring with Tyler Johnson and stuff, but that's what we kind of said. They should be able to make the playoffs with this roster. Yes, I don't know about contenders yet, but they should at least make a run for the playoffs this year. Again, you can find her on Twitter at Brooke underscore L-O-F-O. Brooke, thank you for joining the show this week. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Now we'll head back east. Joining us to discuss the Maple Leafs and the Boston Bruins are Logan Mullen. He covers the Bruins for Nesson, you can reach him on Twitter at by Logan Mullen. Welcome to the show, Logan. What's up? How's it going? I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. We'll, we'll get into some Bruins talk. And of course, we have on the show Rob Del Mundo. He's written Hockey Enforcers, A Dying Breed, and NHL 100 Years of Hockey Glory. As well, he covers the Maple Leafs. You can reach him on Twitter at Rob underscore Del Mundo. Thank you for joining, Rob. Thanks, Peter, for having me. So there were some interesting moves by these two teams. Uh, Maybe not any big flashy moves, of course, like we've seen some other teams, but there were some interesting ones. The Leafs basically stood pat. Um, Everyone except maybe general manager Kyle Dubas wanted to blow it all up, or at least move one of the core. He did not. He didn't even move Morgan Riley, who has only a single season left on his current contract, and of course yeah. lost Zachary Hyman to the Oilers. Was this the right move? Can the Leafs actually contend with this deep core? Rob? In my opinion, for the deep core, I don't think so. I think with if you, you've got... Over half their payroll, or just about half the payroll, tied up in the big four forwards in Matthews, Marner, um, Nylander, and Tavares. And 
when you look at the way they've lost their past uh, elimination games, especially the last two years, game five against Columbus this year, and then three chances to oust the Habs this year. And, well, I, I go to the elimination games in game five and game seven. And if you looked at, at their past six elimination games dating back to, uh, you know, even against the, uh, Boston, the, the two game sevens back to back. And it's not just a matter of they lose. Like, if it's, okay, they lose in double overtime or a goal bounces off the goalpost and it's just a fluke, I can understand that. But in elimination games, this core four, like, they just, they don't show up. Like, I mean, granted, Tavares was hurt, but I mean, like, I mean, even if you go back to game uh, five against Columbus last year, where, uh, again, if you got these four forwards, I mean, so dynamic, so potent in the regular season. And then and over the first, if, as long as it's not an elimination game in the playoffs, I mean, they can, you know, as we saw against Montreal, go out to a 3-1 lead, even when Montreal scores in uh, overtime twice to push it to a seventh game. Something about this group of forwards, the... Uh, Something about their identity, their makeup, I can't put my finger on it, but all I know is in the past six elimination games, they've, they're they 0-6 uh, with this core being outscored. I think it's 41-6 to or 41-7. to I can't mm-hmm. – I can't be um, – um, I might be exaggerating, but not by much. But they, they, they just don't compete. So in terms of what Kyle Dubas could or couldn't do, well, like um, because – uh, he's got so much tied up in those core fours. I mean, you could very well argue that the mistakes weren't ne- not, not necessarily in this past uh, offseason, but in giving Marner that, that $10.69 million deal or, uh, I mean, the, the Tavares contract, I mean, hey, I was excited about it just as much as the next uh, person from Toronto, but that contract looks like a millstone even for the last few years, which we knew the last the back end of that contract wasn't going to be as productive, the, the he was just uh, doubling down basically, and Tavares was the best free agent forward out there. So, I mean, but here we are now, uh, um, like three years later, and it's uh, that that con- contract is a millstone around the the, um, the lease next. So, I mean, in terms of what they did and in trying to replace Zach Hyman, to your point about the free agency, yeah, they've uh, they tinkered with a bit. Kyle Dubas, I think, did what he uh, at the best he could by getting the. Uh, 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 the pluggers who, who are sort of like a, a poor man's hymen, but I mean, um, uh, Nick, Nick Ritchie was a good signing at, uh, for, for two and a half million a year. And then uh, perhaps Logan might back me up on that one. But, uh, in terms of, uh, getting R- R- Ritchie to play on that wing and, uh, um, Andre Hasse, if his, uh, concussion issues don't hold him back and you got the center with uh, David Kampf and then, uh, um, they've got basically these, these versions of the poor man's Zach Hyman. So, uh, that's uh, to, to answer your original question. I don't think they can win this court with this core four, but Kyle Dubas did what he could to try and replace Zach to get to get this team some identity, to get some pushback. Maybe, you know, maybe if you have, you have Richie and Kashe protecting those uh, centers in, in Matthews and Tavares, then maybe, you know, in the playoff come, come, comes a t- uh, comes time and it's an elimination game seven. They don't get pushed around. They they actually show up. They actually show up for, for, for some energy and just not. Uh, and just compete in the elimination game. It's it's one thing to lose an elimination game, but to, to lose like you know four one in game seven and three nothing last year to Columbus. It's just uh, um, and if you're in Toronto, it's uh, to, to say it's painful to watch. It's uh, it's an understatement. <laughs> Logan, uh, let Leaf Nation understand what are they getting out of Nick Ritchie and Kosh. So with Nick Ritchie. You know, he, so his start in Boston was not great. The fit was a little clunky at first. They didn't know how to use him, uh, and he wasn't great in the bubble either. But last year, he did rebound very nicely. Uh, he ended up making his way onto the first power play unit. You know, when I don't know if it's a matter of keeping him engaged or not, but he is a really streaky player, and he was a very good regular season player for the Bruins this year. The problem was that when he disappears, he disappears. And he was basically a non-factor in the postseason. Now, I think the the physical part is a big thing. Like, if if um, the understanding I get from every Maple Leafs person that I follow and am familiar with is they feel like they get pushed around too much. Mm-hmm. I think that Nick Ritchie would help rectify that issue. I think his value as a physical presence perhaps is a little overstated. Uh, you know, he, he's not Tom Wilson. He's not Barkley Goodrow. Take your pick. But, you know, he is a middle six bruiser who can score maybe a high-end fourth liner if they decide they want to use him. 
in that role. With Kasha, I think that's actually a very good lottery ticket. I didn't think that the Bruins had totally closed the door on him. I actually thought it was more likely he would have been back than Nick Ritchie. He's a guy where, when healthy, has a lot of upside as an offensive player. I mean, he was a very useful top six piece with the Ducks. And in 2020 in the bubble, when the Bruins got bounced in the second round by the Lightning, I'd argue that Kasha, even though he didn't score, did end up being probably their best forward. Uh, He's a great skater. He's a really dynamic player. Uh, I can see him being a very nice piece uh, for either Tavares or Matthews. Uh, or even putting him on the third line. Like, I think if you get Andre Kasha at his best, then he's probably a very high-end third-line right winger. But with the Bruins, Craig Smith ended up working out well, so Kasha became expendable Mm -hmm. even on a short prove-it deal. But I think if you want to talk about ceiling, the Maple Leafs might actually end up getting more from Kasha than they would Nick Ritchie. It's really interesting because it seemed like there was almost a – trade between teams even though they were free agents with Nick Felino going the other way to the Bruins uh we could talk yeah. even more about that and even going forward let's talk about the goaltenders there's another thing that looked like another trade the Maple Leafs lost out Fre- Frederick Anderson with him going to the Carolina Hurricanes and they get the Carolina Hurricanes ex-goaltender Peter Morazic three years and at 3.8 million was this the best the Leafs could do in the goaltending market and you can answer the same thing Logan with Linus but Rob we'll go to you first uh yeah was this the best they could do really there I think I don't know that you could have done much better I mean if you look at uh, like Anderson, I think I think the line the writing was on the wall when uh, Campbell got um, uh, got steady enough to be able to uh, uh, like I know he had that hot streak for 15 or 16 straight wins, and th- that's not to suggest that that he can carry that over the course of an entire season. But I mean, with Frederick uh, with the, with the last year on his contract, and uh, like I mentioned before, with the, with the handcuffing of. Uh, the, the big four forwards and plus like having to negotiate Morgan Riley's contract, as you mentioned earlier with this mm. uh, year, they, they, they weren't going to get like a, uh, uh, they, uh, a f- uh, five, six million dollar. I mean, they, they weren't going to get Philip Grubauer, just, just a, for example, just to throw that name out there because he was a uh, UFA. But in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of the, the, the swap, um, I, it's, I mean, they, they save a, a bit of cap space. I think it's been seven or $800,000 by, uh, uh, having uh, by not having to pay Morazic as much now, whether or not he's the uh, person to carry them into the next round, I mean, it's uh, he he's uh, like again if it, if the scouting. I guess Morazic is it, it is kind of streaky. He's hot and cold. I mean, one one line by uh, uh, Ken Campbell in his blocks says uh, that he was known as Peter er- erratic in some circles, but uh, but he provides some feistiness and he provides like a, a bit of edge, a bit of pushback. Um, like I, it, it's a uh, uh, right now, it's, it's it's a matter of uh, at least you have someone, a, a proven goaltender uh, at the NHL level, at least who can um, take shoulder the load off Jack Campbell. Because as I mentioned, I mean, gra- granted, I mean, all the credit to in, in the world for that 15 or 16 game hot streak. And then there was one game last April, I think it was, when uh, he finally got exposed against the Winnipeg Jets. And then the credit to him for all, in that game, it, it was going to happen, <laughs> like eventually. I mean, whether or not Jack Campbell's the proven starter, I mean, I think I think it's going to be a good platoon combination, uh, Campbell and Morazic. But at the same time, I mean, you know, neither one of them is a Vezina Trophy winner and uh, or candidate. And even as as for Frederick Anderson, I mean, I'm just going to go back to like the uh, the elimination games. I mean, Frederick Anderson is a career 0 and 5 in elimination games, two with Anaheim and three with the Leafs. So it's not just with the Leafs that he uh, just uh, couldn't win the game seven. So it's uh, like it's it, it's an effective swap. But um, uh, yeah, it's like I mean I don't consider Morazic a a, a Vezina Trophy candidate by any means, but I mean it's it's a good platoon uh, situation between him and him and Campbell and the and the comp- internal competition should uh, bring out the best in both of them. You so you think they can get the best out of both of them? Can them the tandem of Morazic and Campbell make the Leafs a competitor? And who do you think will be the one A then? 
I'd have to give the the edge to uh, uh to Campbell. I think uh, I, I think just just in terms of his progression, just in, from from coming along with uh, with Dallas and L.A. and uh, uh, I, 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 maybe it's my recency bias. I mean, I'd be lying if I said I've seen him as, as often as I've seen Cam, as I've seen Campbell. Obviously, um, I'll, I'll give the, I'll give the nod to Campbell. Uh, can they carry them over the top? I, I think that's going to be really tough to su- suggest that they could uh, uh, go deep into the playoffs. Like I mean, maybe, maybe a couple rounds here and there, but um, it'd be one of those things where I mean, the, the the except for a Stanley Cup winner to not have Vezina Trophy candidacy. In, in goal, it's it's the exception to the rule. I mean, you you could you could argue like in in 2010 with uh, Anthony Niemi in Chicago, or you know, uh, gosh, 2006 with 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 Cam Ward in Carolina. They didn't necessarily have to be the best uh, over the course of 82 games. They just had to be the best for those two months in um, May and June, and may, maybe that might happen here. But um, I have, uh, on paper, I mean, they're they're very good, but a good tandem, but. Um, uh, as an excellent tandem, if you go back to uh, you know Andre Vasilevsky, as as we've seen, or like I mean, it's a pretty high bar to set, but I mean that's uh, that's what it takes to win, right? And uh, I I would seriously doubt that yeah, either of those are like at at Vas- Vasilevsky like level, <laughs> if that answers your question. Yeah, going back to the black and yellow, they have their own goaltending carousel going on. Tukarask, of course, still unsigned and looks like he's dealing with the injury. So they go out and get Linus Allmark from the Sabres. Four-year deal, $5 million per. Now that's a pretty big raise. Is he worth it though, Logan? So I think he's worth it. I'll say I'm not surprised that the Bruins went with Allmark. I, what did surprise me was the term because that's not a term or a salary that you generally pay a guy that you think is going to be the backup. Uh, mm-hmm. Now... The reason I've kind of been able to rationalize it, my, my theory on it is that the last few years with Tuka Rask and Yaro Halak, they were paying about nine to 10 million per season for their goaltending situation. Olmark's making five, Swayman's making uh, like 800,000 or something like that. They're paying significantly less for their goaltending situation. And if slash when they re sign Tuka Rask, it's going to be prorated. And so, because. Uh, my best guess is that they would not go back uh, to adding Tuka Rask to the roster until his hip rehab was done. Uh, I think it would be a wait to sign him. So even then, you're still going to be paying less for Olmark, Swayman, and possibly Rask mm-hmm. than you were for your goalie situation the last basically four or five years if you want to go back to Anton Kudovin and all of those guys. So I think it was a good idea because the Bruins are a lot more structured of a defensive team than the Sabres star, And some of that just boils down to personnel. Some of that boils down to how Bruce Cassidy coaches. And Olmark is the type of goalie that for years had basically been facing a firing squad every night. And so he's used to facing a lot of high danger opportunities. He's used to having to play all over the place, be all over his crease. I think that they might be able to, the Bruins that is, might be able to get a little bit more out of Olmark just because it, I would guess it's not going to be quite as chaotic for him as it has been the past few years. And so I think at the absolute worst, you're getting Tuka Rask on cheaper deals for as long as he wants to continue to play. And you're still paying less than you had for Rask and Halak the last couple of years. Or Jeremy Swayman takes the job and you've got a good 1A, 1B with Swayman and Omar. But I think at least for the Bruins, because the Rask Halak tandem works so well, I think gone are the days where they're going to play somebody 60 games or even 50. Like, I think the Bruins in an ideal world are looking at their top guy not playing any more than 45 to 48. So I think mm-hmm. the way they built their goaltending situation right now is with that in mind. So you're saying they're going to leave the door open for Tuca to come back when he's ready what's the cap situation there and how much is Tuca gonna be able to take well so that's that's the big question because right now it's a little tight so Mm -hmm. they the they ended up spending spending way more than I think anybody thought they would so right now they're looking at like two million or so in cap space so there are a couple ways to look at it is one you can basically sign Tuka Rask to however much you want and just bury him on long-term IR because he's not going to be ready until at the absolute earliest January. And then you kick that 
cap problem down the road. Uh, it, you know, if there's anything we learned from the last year, it's that, you know, the cap doesn't matter, right? Like there are workarounds with it. And so there's that part of it. But I think another way that the Bruins could approach it if they really wanted to is, you know, Tuka Rask has basically taken away most of his leverage because he said there's nowhere he wants to play but Boston. If that's true, because of his health situation, and this is not laying blame on anybody, but the Bruins had no option but then to go out and get somebody. And mm. they still think they can contend. So they weren't going to just get a placeholder, which is why I think they spent so much on Linus Olmark. So I think the way that the Bruins can spin it to Tuka Rask when they have to tell him, hey, you can only take $2 million, which for one, I think he would be amenable to. Um, but that notwithstanding, they can say to him, we had no choice but to go out and spend to keep this team contending, and that included at the goalie position. So all we can shoehorn you in at under the cap is – Two million or however much, uh, you know, you never know with injuries or whatever what's going to happen by the time January or February rolls around. So that's why I think they ultimately might wait to sign him because it doesn't sound like he's going to field offers from anybody else. So it might just be a problem for later on because they might also there's a possibility he decides through all this rehab, you know what, I'm going to retire. This just isn't worth it, or decides to go and play in Finland. Who knows? But. The, I, the door is definitely not close. I mean, Don Sweeney said as much that the door's open for Tuka Rask, and it sounds like if he decides that's something he wants to pursue, we're months down the road from that being an issue, and they'll figure it out then. Uh, speaking about players going back overseas, uh, I know Bruins fans don't want to hear it, but uh, David Krejci released the statement uh, that he's going home, back to the Czech Republic. How... What's at least for yourself, Logan? What's your fondest memory of David Krejci? Well, so David Krejci, the thing about him is, I think that history is going to ultimately be very kind to David Krejci because he spent his entire career playing behind Patrice Bergeron, and mm-hmm. I don't think people understand just how good of not just an offensive player, but of a two-way player, uh, David Krejci was, and. I think the thing that I'll miss, and this is not necessarily a specific moment, but something that would happen basically on a nightly basis was if you watch him, especially from up high, he does not look fast at all. Like he's not the most swift skater, but at the same time, he's so skilled with the puck and so calm and thoughtful with the puck that it looks like he's moving in slow motion. Mm -hmm. Um, and so just watching him play and find a way to at times make guys who are fringe NHL players, because that's basically who he was playing with on his line for the last few years, you know, to see the way he brought high end play out of uh, quite the collection of guys the last few years was truly amazing to me. And so it's not so much specific memories. I mean, the guy was the leading playoff scorer for the Bruins in 2011 when they won the cup. So you could take, basically any pick from that but it was also just watching the kind of subtle skill that he always had and I I think when people think back on David Krejci years from now especially when Patrice Bergeron's retired he'll be remembered more fondly than he is right now yeah all right let me throw one last thing at both of you uh for Rob what do you think is going to happen with Kyle Dubas in terms of is this his last kick at the can, uh, can with this core? Do you think if they can't win a round, I don't know. I feel there would be a complete meltdown in Toronto. How about you? Absolutely. I, I don't even think that's a question. It's uh, I mean, the, when Brendan Shanahan came on board and had his uh, quote-unquote Shanna plan that was in 2014 and uh, – it was pretty much the bar was so low in Toronto at the time. This is like pre Matthews, of course, who uh, uh, came on board with the first overall pick two years later. But uh, by any stretch of the imagination, were the Leafs to uh, lose in the first round this year or even fail to make the playoffs? And which is it? Just, I mean, the Leafs are not a lock to make the playoffs in the Atlantic Division. So let's even uh, 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 go on that with, with the two Florida teams, with the strength of Boston, you know. Uh, Ottawa coming on. Um, I, I don't. I think the Leafs should make the playoffs, but it's, it's certainly not a lock. But I, I can't see 
uh, Kyle Dubas keeping his job if the Leafs were to not win at least one round this year. And it goes back to, again, it, it, in, in terms of the contracts, in terms of uh, looking back at, at, at Marner's deal, I mean, 10.69, it's, uh, he, it's just uh, a, a matter of, I mean, yeah, yeah, Marner's like a fantastic player, a great playmaker, but was he worth that much uh, of, of the cap? I mean, if you if you look at what the uh, uh, gu uh, guys, proven winners, like uh, Braden Point making, like right now, like uh, I think if, uh, the constant comparison is like, I think Marner and Point signed their contracts at the same time, and Point was like, not nearly. I think it was only seven or eight before he got that big raise just last week. But I mean, mm -hmm. to give Marner that much of the cap when you know a, a guy like Braden Point or even to like to the Bruins point, I mean, I I think they they uh, uh they, they were they, they've been able to contend and uh, with, with not a single player making over uh, eight or nine million. I can't remember what the figure is in, in, in front of me, but, but uh, just in terms of cap management, the the the, the big four. Um, and especially when, um, you know, like, like Tavares, that, that millstone of a contract that I keep coming back to. So it's, it's just a matter of, uh, it, it, I mean, had, had they won a, a couple rounds, then maybe we wouldn't be having this conversation. But the fact that is like on paper, this, this should be like, like this is a talented team and this team should be having more results on, on paper than what, uh, uh, what, what, what we've seen. But I mean, sometimes it's, it's, it's a cliche, but it's not always the, uh, it, uh, the the player the, the team with the best players that wins it's the players with the best team and obviously for all this talent that this that the Maple Leafs have this 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 does not comprise the best the players with the best team there's something wrong that happens when it's a one game single elimination whether it's game seven this year or game five in, against Columbus or game seven twice against the Bruins something just happens with this uh, uh, with this core. And, uh, and I just I just can't foresee any situation uh, where Dubis would keep his job if the Leafs were to uh, fall in the first round again or even fail to make the playoffs, which I think, you know, I, again, it's not a lock that they'll make, make the playoffs this year. And Logan, the Bruins, they didn't make too many moves, uh, but they did lock up Brandon Carlos, six years, $4.1 million, and Taylor Hall, four years at $6 million. Was bring Hall back the right move. He seemed to also, especially like in the playoffs, really fade when they needed him the most. So I do think it ultimately was the right move. I mm. it probably would have looked even better if David Krejci hung around because he hasn't had a, a winger like that in a long time, basically since Nathan Horton and Peak Milan Lucic. I, I do think it was the right move though because the Bruins found a way to get the most out of Taylor Hall. And that's because he doesn't have to be the guy there. In Edmonton, he was almost always, you know, the number one guy. In New Jersey, same thing. In Arizona, the same thing. When in, in Buffalo, obviously, the same thing, especially when Jack Eichel was hurt. In Boston, he, unless Brad Marchand gets hurt, will never see the first line. He'll play a second line role where, where he'll get slightly softer matchups than he's used to seeing. And not only did the Bruins for most of the regular season get a pretty good offensive version of Taylor Hall. They also got a way better defensive version of Taylor Hall. And, you know, the, the conclusion I've come to is that's because he doesn't have to completely empty the tank in the offensive zone because his team is hosed in if he doesn't do that. So I think a thing that pleasantly surprised a lot of Bruins people was that he's a lot better of a defensive player than people thought. And that's kind of what I chalk it up to. So for 6 million, that's, Pretty, you know, it's it's a premium for a second line winger. But when you consider the talent, especially the high end offensive talent that Taylor Hall brings, that deal might end up looking like a bargain. Especially because I don't mind the term. Four years is fine, especially for a guy going into his thirties. That I have no qualms with that deal. I think they had to do that. You can find them on Twitter at Rob underscore Del Mundo for Rob and at by Logan Mullen for Logan. Thank you for stopping by, gentlemen. Thanks for having me. Great. Peter. This was great. Thanks. Yep. Thanks to our guest this week, Brooke Laferno, for all her help, as well with the previous stories we've had on the website, glamsports.com. Logan Mullins' knowledge on the Boston Bruins is very deep, and Rob Del Mundo's books, 
with interesting stories on the history of hockey. Again, you can get all our information on our website, chablamsports.com. For this episode, episode 33, season 6. Everybody, see you next season. Enjoy the rest of your summer. Remember, if you've enjoyed anything you've heard in this episode, or don't, please tweet at me or even our guests. You can follow me on Twitter at Russia98 or the entire team at Jablam Sports. If you want, you can also contact us on our website. Uh, you can use the hashtag at Jablam Sports, uh, Jablam Sports, that's J-A-B-L-A-M, and our website is jablamsports.com slash contact for our contact page there. Please check out our website, go to jablamsports.com to see all our podcasts and even game notes for each episode, including this one, and you'll get our guests' info and links to things we mentioned on this show. Please subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts, including Spotify. And of course, click on the three dots in your podcasting app and share this episode with three friends you know. Please and thank you. Also, follow us on our Facebook group, Jablam Sports. Check us out, folks. Thank you, everyone. And to every one of our listeners, I'm giving you a virtual hug. Stay healthy, listen, be yourself, and stay strong. Thank you.